Large gatherings were among the first things to go amid COVID-19. That meant two years of canceled and delayed wedding ceremonies. But this summer, it was full steam ahead. Were happy couples still looking for the same things for their big day, or did the pandemic change their thinking? Let's ask. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Ramnik Johal, BC reporter at Press Progress, and here in Ontario's capital city, Lindsay Kent, event planner and founder of Pop Up Chapel Co. Welcome to you both. Hi. 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 Um, this takes me back to when I got married and I was so nervous um, and so scared about everything and all the money that was just flying out through the window. Uh, Lindsay, I wanted to uh, start with you. Um, you've been working in the event planning business for a while. Um, I can't imagine people trying to get married during a pandemic. How has the pandemic shaped the wedding industry in Canada and in Ontario? Um, yeah, it was wild uh, for a while there during the pandemic when people were trying to get married. It was a really crazy experience. For us, I think what the pandemic has done for the wedding industry is really given couples permission to plan the wedding that aligns with who they are and with their values and with what they really want. I think prior to the pandemic, there was sort of a set of rules that you had to follow when you were planning your wedding um, that all went out the window when the pandemic happened. And a lot of that permission has really stuck around. Um, and couples are continuing to opt for smaller weddings, to opt for um, higher end experiences for smaller groups of people, and sometimes altogether opting out of all of the traditions. And I think that's really empowering for a lot of couples. You, you made um, you used the word permission a couple of times. And as a wedding uh, planner, I'm thinking that the bigger, the better, because that means that at the end of the day, wedding uh, planners take a bit more money home. Um, yeah. How has the pandemic changed people's approach to weddings? So for me, um, I believe that there isn't a one size fits all way to get married. And um, I, I run two businesses, one of which benefits from really large, beautiful, over the top weddings, and the other which benefits from small micro ceremonies where couples um, you know, don't spend a lot of money. And I think the way in which it's changed how couples approach weddings is that they don't feel the need to spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. They feel like it is normal now to have a really small group of people, maybe 20 people or less. And I think that they just feel the opportunity to um, authentically plan something that reflects who they are as a couple, rather than just like fitting themselves into this narrative of what a wedding should be. And Ramnik, we can all agree that weddings are a joyous occasion. Uh, families are combining, communities come together to support the couple. Um, you were the former editor-in-chief of Five Express, where you wrote a series of articles on the wedding culture in the South Asian community in the past year. Um, what have you observed? Yeah, I think similar to, you know, the, the idea that weddings are getting smaller, people are trying to downsize a little bit, but at the same time, they're also compensating for the smaller guest list. What so do you mean by that? Just because, just because there's less people doesn't mean there's less bells and whistles. So uh, what I kind of observed over the pandemic, and now that, that restrictions are eased, people are going much further over the top, but I still saw smaller weddings, but they would still have, you know, live performers. They would have these expensive, extravagant floor wraps. They would still have multi-day affairs. They would have, you know, all these different added elements that maybe weren't necessarily related to the number of guests that were there. Um, but there were still a lot of things. I mean, since you know, restrictions have eased up. I've seen acrobats, people literally hanging from the ceiling, pouring beverages. I've seen people doing live paintings of the bride and groom at their, either their wedding ceremony or the reception. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So on the one hand, some people are enjoying the smaller weddings. On the other hand, some people are trying to make up for lost time or the, the cost savings, uh, so to speak. And I, and I guess too, they might, there's also new costs, right? Because uh, for a very long time, we weren't able to uh, meet. Uh, a friend of mine just recently had a very small wedding at City Hall, but she live streamed it um, around the world. That's a new cost, right, Ravnik? Yeah, so I've been seeing a lot of people doing that as well. And so they're having, you know, their family members there, so to speak. But at the same time, they're, um, the guests that are there, they're getting way more extravagant gifts. I'm seeing like, bridesmaids proposals where they're getting like hundreds of dollars worth of things and they're having 
professional photographers. And then we're doing the the wedding ceremony, which again, a smaller entourage, but we're making sure we have limousines. We're making sure we have all the bells and whistles for the guests that are there and then live streaming it out to extended family that unfortunately couldn't make it. I've also seen people delaying their receptions a year. So they couldn't have done, they did a small backyard maybe reception during when the restrictions were um, on and then they're doing the thousand person reception now that now that they're allowed to a year later for their one year anniversary. So there really is stuff all across the spectrum. I guess people are trying to find, uh, to, they're trying to make up for the time that's been lost. Um, I wanted to read something uh, just to put into perspective how much money uh, we're talking about and how big weddings are. According to data released by The Wedding Report and published by CNBC, couples in the US are expected to host 2.5 million weddings in 2022, a 30% increase over 2021, and the most in any year since 1982. Vendors who manage to stay in business find themselves busier than ever, and they're raising prices to meet demand. Um, Lindsay, you know, the other side of it is that when weddings were postponed or canceled, uh, vendors had to find a way to stay in business, and those that were lucky enough to stay in business now are experiencing this boom. But again, we're seeing supply chain, inflation, all these other costs. Um, are we seeing a similar boom, uh, wedding boom here in Canada and the trend of rising costs? Absolutely. I would say that across the board for our clients, um, the cost of a wedding has risen anywhere from 35 to 40 percent uh, from previously what it was prior to the pandemic. And the main things that are affecting the um, costs rising would be a shortage of staff. Labor costs are a ton higher. Um, floral shortages and floral costs are a lot higher. There was even a candle shortage for a significant amount of time, which is kind of funny, but it's like weddings need a lot of candles. So that really does affect costs when you're fighting people for the only, the few candles that are available on the market. So across the board, I would say that costs are higher um, and it's affecting us big time because we're the ones as planners, especially who have to communicate the why behind these rising costs to our clients when they may not see the value in spending that much. And even though your, um, your cost might be rising or you're charging more, if you don't have that product, uh, you can't make it happen. You're not magicians. Yeah. yeah, in some cases, we have to break the news to people that there is a shortage of this kind of flour or there's a shortage of this kind of food. And we just aren't able to make some of those dreams happen. But that, that doesn't feel especially new to me because I think ultimately the expectations around weddings and what they look like and what you're going to get can often be a little bit skewed or unrealistic because of what's shown on places like Pinterest. So that conversation doesn't feel new to me. It, what does feel new to me is that um, we have to explain why these things are so scarce and why they cost so much. And that's a new conversation and it's difficult for people to understand. Lindsay, you brought up something we're going to come back to in just a moment. But Ramnik, um, you've spoken to couples who decided to elope instead of having a wedding, uh, which is a huge departure from Indian traditions. Um, how did they come to make that decision? Yeah, so I spoke to a couple who eloped during the pandemic and they were kind of thinking it was a twofold answer. First, it was obviously the fact that they had to do a smaller guest list, but they were also grappling with their parents' expectations. So their parents, you know, expected that their, you know, only son or their only daughter or their eldest daughter or their youngest son, there's always something, is going to be the one to have a big wedding that they get to invite, you know, their extended family, their friends' friends, their cousins' friends from back home in India. And the thought that they would take that away from their parents was something that they struggled with. But when they thought about their own kind of desires, they didn't want to have to spend that much money on a wedding and, and they'd rather save for a down payment. And so they said, although our parents were very disappointed, uh, they, you know, it took a lot of convincing for them to come on board. They ultimately decided to have a small wedding in Whistler with just the two of them and their dog and they had a photographer. And they said that it was honestly the best decision they ever made because on the other hand, we have it's not uncommon for a lot of people to take out loans to pay for their kids' weddings and sometimes go into debt to pay for their kids' weddings, which, which on average are costing you know upwards of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, and that's average, uh, which is mind-boggling to say the least. 
Um, so, you know, they were really grappling with that cultural expectation. And, and a funny anecdote that he shared with me was that my dad eventually got on board and he said, it's okay if, if you guys don't want to have the big wedding, just hurry up and have babies. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> there is always going to be something. Let me tell you, there is always <laughs> When are you getting married after you get married? When's the baby? When's the second baby? Um, but you said something that I thought was interesting, Remy, because um, I think we focus so much on the wedding day when the focus maybe should be on the marriage itself. Would you say then that this has been a silver lining through the pandemic when it does come to having these huge weddings when people do go into so much debt? We see how a high housing costs are and then to start uh, that partnership when you are in debt can be really detrimental to people. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the folks that I spoke to, I spoke to counselors who work with, um, you know, young, especially in this community, this young South Asian folks who are either getting married, planning their wedding, and they shared that oftentimes this emphasis on, on the wedding detracts from really important conversations. So couples will be planning their wedding sometimes two to three years in advance, um, just because here in, in the Lower Mainland, venues are scarce. So a lot of the time, especially if you're having a religious ceremony, um, if you're looking for a banquet hall, uh, Venues are scarce and they're booked years in advance. So couples are making these decisions sometimes years in advance to book their weddings. And then they're not having these important conversations. And so sometimes it gets closer to the wedding date and they're like, we don't actually want to get married. We don't actually like each other. And sometimes they go forward with it. And what we've been seeing is a rise in large, you know, lavish $100,000 weddings and then divorces a year later. And so kind of the, the premise of the series that I wrote was to urge people to have these conversations with whether it's their parents that are pushing them towards this path, whether it is their partners that may maybe have this idea of what they wanted their dream wedding to look like, that's all fine if that's something that you want, but to make sure you're also having deeper conversations because the cost of it is uh, pretty pictures, but um, you know they, the sentiment behind them is definitely missing, so. And, and Lindsay, you know, before in the past, I think you had two options when you did get married. You either had, you know, this small ceremony at City Hall or you had this big extravaganza where it's like, oh, everybody's looking at me and oh my God, all the money that's flying out the window. But your company, Pop-Up Chapel Co., was designed to fill that gap. Um, what are some of the reasons your clients choose to use your service instead of doing the City Hall or the big uh, traditional wedding? Yeah, so to reiterate what was just been said, a part of the reason that a lot of our couples choose um, the Pop-Up Chapel Co. is because it gives you sort of an option in between where you're still able to have this absolutely beautiful wedding with beautiful pictures and high-end vendors, um, but for a fraction of the cost. So it's a lot more affordable. But further to that, um, the sustainability piece is a really big one for a lot of our couples at the Pop-Up Chapel Co. 10 couples create less waste than one couple typically would on their wedding day, which is a big one for a lot of younger people getting married these days. Um, further, it's the simplicity of it all. You literally book your wedding online the same way that you'd book a hotel or that you'd rent a car. And um, that does give you a lot more time in your relationship leading up to your wedding day to really focus on your marriage. Like we were just talking about, instead of focusing on all of the wedding planning details. Um, and then further to that, uh, the Pop-Up Chapel Co. is incredibly inclusive like in terms of the types of couples that we see coming through and getting married we have people from every background from every sexual orientation from every gender identity um, we have interracial couples we have um, couples from different religions and so it's a place where they can feel seen um, and represented within the marketing and feel like this is a place that I can get married and have an experience that really speaks to what I want. And Ramnik, you know, I just want to go back to what we were talking about before, um, because right now the silver lining that the, we are still in a pandemic, but maybe taking that choice, uh, being in that situation where couples weren't forced to have these big weddings because we couldn't have it. Um, would you say it's more difficult to choose alternative options to get married in the South Asian community? I would say so. I think that there is a lot of, again, cultural expectation that that's the way that things are going to go. And and I, I don't blame our parents necessarily because they're a product of, you know, how they were they were brought up. But things were much different when they were in, in India and growing up. And they would invite everybody in the village, and it was a very communal thing. Like people would, um, you know, offer money as blessings, but often that money was used to to pay for the weddings. And that sentiment still exists here. But now we're talking about weddings that are. 
uh, thousands and thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I think it is difficult. And I heard a lot of people through, you know, publishing the story, reaching out to me saying, I didn't know that there was another option. And, and they were like, it feels like this party is so much more for my parents than it is for me. And I was like, it's beautiful that you can give that to your parents, but it's also so much more important that you do what you want to do because at the end of the day, that's going to build up so much resentment. And oftentimes your parents are going into debt because that's what they think you want and you don't want it. So you're resenting them. And, and I had a girl reach out to me and she said, before reading this, I did never actually talk to my parents about wanting a smaller wedding. And she was like, because it's just the way everybody else is doing things. And I think that it just builds into this machine where it's it's almost an assumption. Okay, well, my cousin down the street did a week-long $100,000 affair. So, of course, I have to do that and invite everybody my parents have ever met. Um, but no, there is another way. And I think that people are starting to clue into that, that it really is about what you want. And if that big wedding with the Ferris wheel, there was one with <laughs> Ferris wheel, and sorry, mind you, if that's what makes you happy, knock yourself out. If not, ask yourself what you want and just tell your parents because it'll save everybody a headache. So Ramnik, how do I get to be your plus one to these weddings? Because I need yeah. to. <laughs> well, they'll invite anybody. Just come grab coffee with them. You're going to get an invite. Let me tell you, like it's not that hard to get invited to one of these things. They'll invite everybody they've ever met. <laughs> I, I love a wedding. Um, Lindsay, uh, you've worked with many couples who are from the LGBTQ community and new immigrants. Um, what is it about smaller weddings that appeal to them? Um, I think a lot of the times that people in the LGBTQ community and maybe new immigrants just don't really see themselves, like I said before, in the marketing for the wedding industry, it's, it's marketed to cis, heterosexual, white, affluent people for the most part. And, you know, through the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of that has changed and the wedding industry has opened their eyes to a lot of that. But I still think that there's a real gap in who the wedding industry and these big lavish experiences are marketed to. And so I think that the reason that we're attracting a lot of couples in these communities is because A, they see themselves in our marketing and B, they don't really identify with this idea of this massive over the top wedding that celebrates um, their love because they haven't seen it. So uh, that's why I think we attract so many of those kind of couples and, and I'm so glad that we do. And further to Ramnik's previous point about South Asian couples kind of feeling like they have to follow a certain um, expectation. We've actually seen a rise of South Asian couples coming through our pop-up chapel, which is very exciting to me because when I first started this business, I did not, I thought that the, I thought we were just going to attract like cool hipsters that wanted to like buff tradition, but I was so wrong. Like the, the type of people that we were attracting are people that are just like, I don't want to do that. And I just want to get married to the person that I love. And that is literally anyone and everyone who wants to get married to the person that they love. And so, yeah, we're seeing more and more South Asian couples come through our chapel, which is super exciting. You know, and the stress uh, of like picking flowers and decorations and all that stuff. I mean, so much stuff to organize. But Lindsay, you mentioned the, Pinst the Pinterest bride. Um, I have to admit that I am obsessed to watching like the wedding channel, <laughs> HGTV, Shop for the Dress, all other shows I am watching. Uh, but Ramnika, you wrote about the bride to influencer pipeline in one of your pieces. I just wanted to read a paragraph from that uh, you wrote. Weddings become highly publicized events that transcend beyond the day or week of the event itself and are staged, showcased, and packaged up not only for the sometimes thousands of guests, but also for complete strangers on the internet. We watch in awe as a complete stranger gets their fairy tale moment and take notes for when we eventually will have our own. Um, Ramnik, how does this uh, bride, in bride influencer, I think, how does this bride influencer phenomenon lead into existing culture of comparison and lavish pursuit that you wrote about? Yeah, so I think the culture of comparison is is not new. I think again, because you know our communities are so interconnected and interrelated, it's been a thing. You know, your your mom's going to talk about your cousin down the street's wedding and how big it was and how maybe we should try to do something similar, if not better. But I think that social media has created a situation where people are maybe going bigger and doing bigger things and finding these like niche venues or finding these niche, you know quirks or buying the most expensive lavish designer outfits and 
just doing all of these these things and making sure they have, you know, these crazy shots that make it look like they're in vogue, but you have to do a pre-wedding shot, an engagement photo shoot, a wedding day photo shoot, a post-wedding photo shoot, a reception photo shoot, all of these types of things, a video, music video sometimes, but oftentimes who is that for? And it is to post on Instagram. And so oftentimes we see people and I don't blame them, you know, of course you want to share your wedding, but what it what it ends up doing is feeding this cycle because people see, oh, this person had this at their wedding, so we should also try and do something similar, if not crazier. And so I have cousins who got married 10 years ago and they 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 mentioned that it was similar then, but as Instagram grew, I feel like a lot of these weddings and the sizes of these weddings and the extravagance and just how lavish the decor is and how lavish all of these things are, how lavish the performances are, um, has also increased tenfold. And that's because it is really a spectacle. And and I, I'm critiquing it, but the call is coming from inside the house because I'm also saving all of these things on my Instagram. I'm watching, I am, I am literally taking notes. I am devouring it. But that's, that's part of the problem is I'm sending it to my friends. Like, did you see what those people did at their wedding? It was so wild. It was so big, but people love that. And they see that people are engaging with it. And so the next person is like, I'm getting married, you know, on the top of Grouse Mountain or something. I don't know. That hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Watch. Um, and so it really just feeds into this crazy, crazy loop where all of these like really niche luxury, what we would think is a luxury thing just becomes normal. And so now it's normal to spend 80 to $100,000 on a wedding. And that's just the standard. I mean, the cost of dresses, when I went to shop for my wedding dress, I was like, ah, excuse me, what? I had no idea. And now I think to get married and then social media and all those, like the pressures. Uh, Lindsay, in your view, um, how has social media impacted this business of love? So I have a kind of, like my opinion on this is two-sided, right? On one hand, I think it creates these expectations that people feel pressured to meet, to follow. I think a lot of the time it gives them a lot of stress because just like Romnique was just saying, it makes them feel like they have to do all these things to look that beautiful, to have this luxury experience. But on the other hand, I recognize that sharing our lives on social media is part of our cultural fabric as millennials, as Gen Zers. And I think that um, sometimes people in older generations than us don't really understand our want and our need to do that because it is a way that we feel seen and validated and, and part of this world. So for me, on one hand, it's like, I love it because as a creative, as a person who loves design, it gives me and my team and my industry the opportunity to create these special, gorgeous experiences that are incredibly beautiful to look at. Um, but on the other hand, I'm like, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. And what I think is really great about the Pop-Up Chapel Co. is that we create this beautiful aesthetic experience that you can absolutely share on the gram or on TikTok or wherever but it's shared between 10 people and the cost becomes a lot less. So this idea of having a beautiful wedding um, in that sort of aesthetically gorgeous space becomes a lot more attainable and less stressful. And Ramnik, you've uh, lived both in BC and in Ontario. Um, is there a difference between South Asian weddings in the East versus West Coast? I feel like they're honestly just as big. I've seen both sides in both uh you know in ontario and in vancouver and i think because of social media there is really no borders anymore because i'm watching people's weddings in ontario who are having you know these performers who are paying i've heard upwards of 20 to 30 to forty thousand dollars for some of these famous punjabi singers let me tell you they charge a pretty penny and so you've got people having flying these people out to perform at their weddings or having you know all of these crazy things and, and it transcends across uh, across the country for sure uh people are going to throw a party if they want to throw one but yeah i agree with i agree with Lindsay. i think it is you know it is a product of of the world that we're living in everybody's chronicling everything and you have a dog instagram you have a baby instagram you have your instagram which has everything that you've ever done and it's just normal now it's normal to consume it but i think it's also should be a thing where we stop and ask ourselves the why behind why we're doing it and i think that when i started writing this series i realized a lot of people never really ask themselves that question and, and it's created this 
machine that's gotten kind of out of control because I did hear anecdotally as well from a few people that sometimes vendors um, have denied working with them if they didn't want to post their pictures on Instagram. And sometimes they ask uh, the, the following that people have before deciding to work with them. And that's for, for larger vendors. So it really is a beast that's out of control. But I think if people are doing it based on what their own desires are, then it's okay. Knock yourself out, really. And just make sure you invite me. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to do a quick follow-up because you said you, when you started the series, uh, people didn't know the why they were having these big weddings. Did you find the answer? I think it's it's depends on the person. Either it's their parents, either it's their desire to kind of put forth this, this lavish party for whether it is their loved ones, which is really important, again, like for our parents who immigrated here and have maybe attained a certain level of status that they never had before, they want to throw these parties. They want to be able to invite people they love and celebrate their journeys as well as their, their kids' journeys. Um, but for others, it's very much they're, they're driving themselves into debt, just trying to keep up with the Joneses. And so I think some people have kind of started to realize that, and I'm starting to see smaller weddings and i think that the people that are doing big weddings if they're doing that to their hearts content and nobody's getting harmed and nobody's going into debt then then that's all fine and dandy as well but i think the why really depends on the couple but i think it started to create a conversation where people are like okay let's talk about this let's talk to our parents about what we want and what we actually want to do um, or let's just do our own thing and elope and forget everybody. And that's something that we haven't really seen on this scale before. So hopefully we see more of that. Lindsay, we've got about 30 seconds. Um, what do you see happening in the near future for the wedding industry in this country? I definitely think that the boom will settle down at some point. I do think it's a bit of a false boom as a result of two years of missed weddings. But I do still see a trend towards smaller weddings. I do see couples continuing to buck tradition and to focus on what actually makes sense for the life that they want after the wedding. Um, and we're seeing that even with the response to the release of our 2023 dates. We have almost 400 couples through our chapels now going for this smaller route. So I don't see it slowing down. Ramnik and Lindsay, thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. We appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thanks for having us. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.